When your muscle and your liver become insulin resistant, glucose becomes trapped in the blood. That's a problem. So if you go into, again, if you go into the research and you start to really investigate what's hope happening here, you'll see this all over the place. They draw these fancy pictures with these transport proteins and insulin molecules and insulin receptors, and you end up with a picture that looks like this. So let's walk through this right here. First step, it's called fatty acid flux, or basically increase in fatty acids in your diet. So that happens in the blood first. Second step, tell the insulin receptors to, to reject insulin. Step three, don't allow glucose to enter the cell using these things called glucose transporters. As a result of that, less glucose comes in to build that glycogen molecule, and as a result, you end up with less glycogen. See the problem? Too much fat to begin with, now we can't store carbohydrate or glucose. Okay, so again, I want to reiterate this and hit this on the head. The accumulation of fat in muscle and liver traps glucose in the blood. That's the problem. That's insulin resistance. That's prediabetes. That's what happens in type 2 diabetes as well. Now, it turns out that dietary protein also has a very similar effect, independent of fat. So in some studies that were performed to try and understand exactly how protein affects your blood glucose values, what some researchers found was very eye-opening. So you see this complicated graph here on the left. Let's walk through it really slowly. On the very bottom, we have a curve which shows what happens to your blood glucose after you eat a low-fat, low-protein meal. So you see how your blood glucose rises and then comes right back down? Okay? That's what's called a normal glucose response or a normal glycemic response to a meal. If you simply increase the amount of protein in that meal, okay, you go from 5 grams of protein to 40 grams of protein, look what happens your blood glucose response goes up. We didn't touch fat. We only added protein. If you add fat and you take away the protein, you get a similar response. What happens if you add fat and protein together? If you add fat and protein together, you get that response. So what this shows you here is that by simply adding either fat or protein, and I'm talking considerable quantities of either one, you end up elevating your blood glucose more and more and more. If you have a meal that contains both glucose, I'm sorry, both fatty acids and protein together, your glucose is highest. It's a problem. Okay. So now, what happens is that when you've been diagnosed with diabetes, how many of you guys have been told to restrict your carbohydrate intake? Is that something? Raise your hand high. Raise your hand high. I want to see it. A lot of you. Okay. So again, doctors are not bad people. There, I have five doctors in my family, absolutely wonderful people. The tools they've been given, the education they've been given is insufficient. And so as a result of that, they say, oh, you've been diagnosed with diabetes. Carbohydrates are your enemy. Let's put you on a low-carbohydrate diet. So that's what happens is that you, you shift away from the blue, the carbohydrate, and you start to eat more red and more green, more fat, more protein. This complicates the problem. So whether you have type 1, type 2, gestational diabetes, prediabetes, that's what happens. They, they push you towards this you know, high-fat, high-protein diet and you become more and more insulin resistant. So low carbohydrate diets you know, have been given a ton of different names over the course of time. You first started with the Atkins diet back in the 1970s, and then that went through, that became the de facto low carb diet. From that point, in the 1990s, you had the, the South Beach diet, the Zone diet, you have the Paleo diet, you have the Ketogenic diet, and then you have things like Dr. Bernstein, who's uh, the ultra low carbohydrate solution. You guys seen these types of diets marketed on TV, commercials? Okay? They're all just different incarnations of a low-carbohydrate diet. And they all have the same effect, which is that they increase your, your level of insulin resistance. Now, here's another thing that kind of complicates the fact. If you look in the literature, uh, you'll see these types of you know, studies that get reported in the New York Times and the Washington Post, where they basically say, look, we directly compared a low-fat diet versus a low-carb diet. And here's what we found. The title of this paper basically says, Comparison of Low and High Carbohydrate Diets for Type 2 Diabetes. And the conclusion shown here in red is, I'll read it to you, both diets achieved substantial weight loss and reduced hemoglobin A1C, again, that's your average blood glucose marker, and fasting glucose. The low carbohydrate diet, which was high in unsaturated fat and low in saturated fat, achieved greater improvements in the lipid profile. So that means that your cholesterol level came down blood glucose stability, and reductions in diabetes medication requirements, suggesting 
that low carbohydrate diets are an effective strategy for the optimization of type 2 diabetes management. So the conclusion that the authors came to is that low carbohydrate diet, one, it's better than a low fat diet. But if you do a little bit of digging and you actually read what happened in this study, what you'll find is this, that in the low carb diet, okay, the high fat diet, they're eating 60% of their calories from fat. That's exactly right. That's, that's what happens in a low carb diet. In the low fat diet, they're actually eating 30% of their calories from fat. So they call it a low fat diet, but they feed people 30% calories from fat. It's not a low fat diet. It's not even close to a low fat diet. So this, these, these types of studies are flawed at their core, and they're all over the place. And they drive people, and they drive policy changes towards more low carbohydrate diet, more low carbohydrate diet. So you guys are now educated. When you see this type of information, dig deep and find out what's actually happening here, okay? Robbie and I like to say this all the time. There isn't a single low-fat study that shows that a truly low-fat diet, which is less than 10 or 15% of your diet, does worse than a low-carbohydrate diet. There isn't a single study that we can find. Okay? So when we're talking about a low-fat diet, we're talking about a diet that contains, at most, 15% of calories from fat. And that's very important. So low-carbohydrate diets promote short-term improvements in a lot of things. How many of you guys know somebody that's eaten a low-carbohydrate diet? How many of you guys are on low-carbohydrate diets right now? Raise your hand. Raise them high. Okay. How many of you guys have interacted with somebody who said, oh yeah, I'm on this low-carbohydrate diet and I lost a ton of weight. I lost weight, my glucose improved, I, my cholesterol dropped, right? You've heard this before, right? And that's because low-carb diets work. They absolutely work, but they work in the short term. They're not effective long-term strategies. They're not effective long-term solutions because they actually increase your risk for chronic disease. But you can't see that in the short term because all you're focused on in the short term is that you get a better A1C value, you reduce your blood glucose variability, meaning you get less swings and you get a much more stable blood glucose, which is a good thing. You can reduce your total insulin use you can reduce your, your LDL cholesterol, the bad cholesterol, and you can lose a ton of weight. The problem, though, is if you look in the literature and you really try and understand what is the effect of a low-carbohydrate diet in the long term, I'm talking six months, nine months, 12 months, two years, five years, 10 years of a low-carbohydrate diet, what you will find is that low-carbohydrate diets that are high in fat and high in protein end up developing a lot of the problems that you see here. So as far as heart disease is concerned, we have increased risk for heart disease, for hypertension, increased LDL cholesterol, increased triglycerides, and increased risk for atherosclerosis, which is the hardening of blood vessels all around your body. In you also see in the glucose side of things, you get an increased level of insulin resistance. Does, that, does it make sense why insulin resistance would start to predominate? Right? This, think of the picture we, we painted earlier. More fat causes less glucose. Glucose has to stay out, gets trapped in the blood. So you get more insulin resistance, and as a result of that, your liver builds up fatty acids, and you can develop a condition known as fatty liver, which can eventually lead to liver cirrhosis and eventually liver failure. You can also significantly increase your risk for cancer. This is now being shown. You can significantly increase your risk for kidney failure because your protein intake is very high. You get increased total body inflammation, which is measured by a protein called C-reactive protein. And then in the long term, we see that you, people end up actually either gaining weight or preventing the loss of further weight. Low energy, impaired digestion, food cravings, the list goes on. So that's why we have to understand that low carbohydrate diets, even though they work in the short term, are not effective strategies for the long term because they actually increase your risk for the development of other health complications.